Hey guys, welcome back. As always, I hope you're doing well tonight. It is a beautiful Friday evening. We are going to be getting into the weeds with a game called Robo Army. And as always, let's get into it. So, I have no experience with this game whatsoever. It is arguably uh, one of the silliest damn games, I think, that I have ever played. I can tell that the game tries to ooze machismo and stuff, but to be honest with you, it just comes off as really corny and super campy. So I, as I had stated in a previous video, I'm, I'm not really a huge fan of side-scrolling beat-em-ups anymore. Like, I, I had my time with those, and eventually, in my teens, I had outgrown them. Okay, that's fine. So... This game kind of revolves around a gentleman, quote, quote, here that has various weapons built into him and stuff. And it, it definitely gives me Robocop and Terminator vibes with a little slice of commando in the background. As always, it has that striking SNK art style as well as uh, those beautiful, beautiful graphics that we typically saw out of these games in the... Uh, in the 90s so the game's just silly and that's okay i like it there wasn't too many games i don't think that had you picking up an arm you know and beating somebody with it it literally gives new meaning to the phrase beating a motherfucker with another motherfucker and i think that i can really appreciate that i was not really the best at this game i missed most of my shots and stuff like i, I missed them all to high hell and it just really was not great you know, I remember just like going and trying to figure this game out because I had no experience with it. And I kind of missed it a little bit, you know, like I kind of missed having that experience because I remember as a kid, if you got a new game, right, you would be like, oh man, I got this game. And granted back then, if you went out and got a cartridge from like a yard sale or anywhere else for that matter, there was a good possibility that it was just going to be the cartridge. Because we had this incredibly nasty habit back then of just going and throwing the box out. And I really hated that. You know, we did with NES games, we did with SNES games and stuff. So the interesting thing about it is that um, with arcade games, like, they would give you the base rundown of um, what the basic controls were. And that was pretty much it. And then a lot of the time on the side of the cabinet, there would be, like, more advanced moves. Well, obviously, I do not have the damn cabinet at my disposal. So one of the joys of playing this game was I got to go back to that era of, okay, well, we have no manual, you know, we, we have no cabinet to stare at the side of. We're literally just going to go and we're going to have to wing it and figure out how this game works and then just learn to play it by ear. And so it was a really interesting experience because I felt like I've been babied in gaming for so damn long that I literally forgot this process. Nowadays, uh, with the way that things have progressed, you don't really... It was kind of interesting because with older games and stuff, you had basic controls and then uh, sometimes a very detailed manual depending on what the hell it was that you were playing. And then from there, it became basic manuals with lovely art and stuff that we saw with like the NES and a lot of the SNES games. And then that went on for a while. And I was like, okay. And then with the PlayStation generation, manuals got even thinner. And it was just like the basics and stuff. And um, a lot of manuals would cover things like swapping discs mid-game. It feels like a multi-CD title and stuff. And so we were functioning off of that. And then I would have to say around the PS2 era, um, learning about the game was kind of split up and it was very oddball. You know, you had two types of games. You had those that had like an in-game tutorial that you would go and you would follow in stuff. And that was pretty much how you learned how to go and play the game. And then you had those that had very, very dummy thick manuals that were often in color and they were just bitching and it was great. And so that's how you would learn how to play the game and stuff. I would have to say around the Xbox 360, Xbox One era was really where shit kind of hit the fan in terms of hand-holding. You know, we saw games on a regular basis go and employ tutorials, which is great. I'm glad that we can save on paper. It doesn't bother me whatsoever. The problem that I had with it, I think, is a lot of the times tutorials were not done well. And I would see this a lot on 360 games. They would be like, okay, 
if you do this and this, it will equate to this, and this is how you do this, and all kinds of other stuff. So it was really, I think, just kind of one of those things where you kind of look at it and you say to yourself, oh, okay, this is done, like, really, really poorly. And so it managed to get even worse with the um, Xbox One generation, essentially, you know, because at least with the 360 generation, we still had paper-thin manuals that would give you, like, a basic control scheme and then for other games like ones made by um, Bethesda you'd have like a dummy thick manual that would just give you the rundown of everything and it would normally have really nice artwork on the inside and then of course they would go and they would ship with a map which was really cool especially if you're like marking stuff down and stuff I remember uh, going and being in my college years and um, marking down stuff on Bethesda maps it's like this bitching item is currently here at these coordinates and that was really good but with the Xbox One generation, they tried a lot harder, I think, um, to go and refine the idea of every game having a tutorial. Games don't have manuals anymore. Most of the time when you open up a fresh game, there's nothing in there aside from maybe a promotion for another game. Or sometimes if it was like a pre-ordered game, it would be a card with some DLC. But aside from that, we don't really have manuals anymore. All the learning for the game is literally done in the game via tutorial so it's kind of like a stark contrast i think between newer games and older games because with older games if you didn't have the manual you had to figure that crap out right so you're going and you're mashing buttons and every now and then you would run into something new and you'd be like holy crap how did i do that and you would like fuck around until you figured it out again and with newer games there's really just no sense of wonder it's just like hi welcome to the tutorial level we're going to teach you everything that we possibly can. And so it's really interesting because like with newer games, since they literally give you everything up front, I feel like the player doesn't really have any, uh, any of those aha moments. You know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like the player really sits down and says to themselves, oh, this is cool. How did I do that? Like, they don't really get to figure things out anymore. You know, they don't really explore. They don't really get to use their noodle too much. I mean, thinking about it now, there's not a lot of games that really do make you uh, use your noodle too much, unfortunately. So, when I was going and learning how to play this game, I was having like a lot of aha moments. I was like, hey, this is pretty cool, or hey, this does this, this does that, and I actually really liked it. Because this game actually has a little bit of complexity to it, which is uh, something you don't really get to see too often in arcade games, because most of them are very simplistic and straightforward. So it was actually really, really nice because on the surface, there are, um, on the surface, it's just basically a uh, basic brawler with weapons and stuff. Like it kind of has that splatterhouse aesthetic a little bit where you're just kind of going and it's like, oh, I have this body part. I can pick it up and beat somebody else with it. And it's actually, it's really fun. You know, it's, it's very simple fun and I've actually learned to enjoy it. But on the other end, I'm kind of like just sitting here and I'm realizing, like, the entire time I was going and playing this game for the sake of filming and stuff, I'm realizing to myself, yeah, there's definitely more to this game. So it was just nice to go and have that experience. It was um, one of the few games where my godson was like, hey, you know, we're going to just go ahead and let you play this and be bad at it. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, grateful, to f I'm grateful for that. You know, let's just go ahead and uh, have that experience, per se. So it was really just kind of one of those interesting things, I think, because I don't really get to have too many aha moments anymore. So it was like literally fun to sit down and do this. And I really like the character designs for like the enemies and stuff. And, you know, the main character himself is just really, really goofy. And the, uh, the design of those shoes just kind of cracked me up a little bit because... It's evident that they're supposed to be sneakers, right? They're supposed to be like those Converse All-Star style sneakers and stuff. And yet, for some reason, the sneakers themselves come off as uh, very, very, I guess, robotic, like mechanical. I don't know. You know, so it's just one of those um, silly things, I think. You know, it, it makes me laugh. A fair bit. I go and I look at it and it's just like so cheesy that I just kind of sit there and I'm like, alright, you know, this is it. And then the game itself is kind of outrageous because it's like, I have this super attack. My entire chest is going to open up and decimate everything around me. And then 
you have attacks like that where the enemy just says, fuck you, picks you up, noms on you a little bit, then puts you down. And I really just kind of... I, I miss stuff like this, you know? Like, I, I miss the goofiness and everything else, and I miss, like, the exploration of going and playing a new game. You know, like, I don't really think we get that too much anymore, and it really just kind of breaks my heart. Ew. But I also thought it was kind of funny because looking back at uh, games like this and stuff, I don't know what the hell was going on, but in between the 80s and the 90s, it seems like every single villain had to have, like, some sort of eye patch, right? They had to, uh, it's almost like it was part of the super villain slash regular villain, evil villain dress code. It's like, okay, this villain is going to be dressed in a bitching suit. They're going to have a goatee, maybe a soul patch, some slicked back or poofy hair, and they have to have an eye patch. And you know somebody in the background was like, hey, why do they have to have an eye patch?" And then the other guy who had brought it up was probably sitting there thinking something along the lines of, fuck you, that's why. You know, no advanced reasoning, this is just kind of how it is. And, you know, I think that it was really just kind of one of those things. And so, like, you see it a lot with a lot of these uh, villains from the 80s and 90s, and it's just so cheesy. You know, like, they always have, like, that eye patch and that devilish grin, and it, it's just so damn corny to me. And yet, strangely enough, now that I'm older and I'm going back and, you know, I'm looking at it and stuff, I'm just kind of sitting there saying to myself, you know what, that's all right. It doesn't bother me. I kind of cherish it a little bit. And then, of course, Robotic Birds was definitely a thing back then, too. Oh man, so many mechanical birds. And they were all such a fucking pain in the ass to kill, too. Oh man, I hated that shit. It was just so damn bad. And then these stereotypical Japanese-style robots. Like, you ever notice that about Japanese robots? Like, all the other robots that everybody else produced, they had weird shit like visors or two eyes and stuff. For some reason, with uh, Japanese culture in general, I never really understood this, but especially in, like, the mecha genre, you ever notice how a lot of the bots just have, like, a single eye that just kind of looks around? Like, you see it in Gundam a lot, you see it in Ghost in the Shell, like, you see it in so many mecha genre pieces of media it's just like this single eyeball most of the time the eye itself is red and it just kind of wanders around sometimes a laser traces from it i just never really understood where that stems from like it very much so pegs me as like a cultural phenomena but i just never really understood you know what the inspiration for it was and i always just thought it was like one of those oddities i think you know and it, it feels very much so like a uniquely Japanese thing, you know? It's like, how do we know it's a Japanese game? Does that robot have a single eyeball? Do we know? It has a single eyeball. Very good. It's probably Japanese, <laughs> you know? And I always thought that it was, um, it was very strange. And then another thing I noticed with a lot of the mecha genre as well is, um, a lot of the arms always have like this uh, induction tube design to it how it's not like like you notice a lot of the times with um european mecha as well as um american mecha you know the design is like these big blocky arms that have like claws and stuff on them and then with a lot of what the japanese had going on they had like a lot of rounded limbs and stuff as well as you know, these tube-style arms that would just kind of snake around and stuff, and... It's very interesting to see how cultures do things differently, I think. I've always kind of really, really liked that, because I, I think as a player I could go back and look at, um... What we were doing versus what they were doing, and then, like... You would go and just kind of make that comparison. It was always really interesting. Like another thing that the Japanese have a tendency to do, and I even see this with a lot of uh, Chinese media as well, is it looks like a lot of their mechas always have a helmet built in. 
Like, you go and you look at, like, a lot of um, American robots and a lot of American, American mecha in general. <coughs> the tops of the heads are always rounded off and stuff. But you look at, like, a lot of Japanese media, and it almost looks like the, uh, the mechas themselves are going and wearing a type of uh, body armor, even though they wouldn't really need body armor because, well, it's a robot, you know? So I always thought it was kind of strange how when you go and you look at, like, a lot of these characters... They always kind of have like those World War II style uh, German helmets, essentially, where the front fringe has that raised upper lip a little bit, and then you have the uh, the neck guard in the back. And I always thought it was like really interesting how they would try to incorporate that into a lot of the um, a lot of the mechas that they would go and produce and stuff. So I feel like the standard staples of enemies are all uh, here as well. We have the standard, you know, mechanized robo-spider and stuff, and like seeing small little robotic spiders was incredibly common back then. It wasn't just common in gaming, it was common in movies and stuff, like a lot of horror movies, you know, used to do that as well. I can't remember what horror movie it is. If anybody knows, let me know, but it was literally this tiny little uh, mecha spider that had like a needle for a face and it would literally walk around stab people in its face and inject them with acid and stuff and you know that's how they would die but you know seeing like these little tiny um spiders and their spider zombies <laughs> seeing these little tiny um spider robots that would constantly walk around and stuff was in incredibly common back then and so as we can see with a lot of these little robots here they try to give them as much of a human aesthetic as possible you know, like, I think with, um, I think with the Japanese, it's actually really interesting because you look at, um, how they meld the two together. And so, like, with Western Mecha, well, with Western androids and stuff, they try to make them look as human as possible, and then they just chrome it out. You know, like, you see that a lot, especially with, um, movies like Terminator, how, like, the T-800 literally goes and it looks like a human skeleton with, like, mechanical bobs and bits for the most part. Even keeping, like, a very human jaw, very human eyes, and then, uh, temples, teeth, all that jazz. But I find that with the Japanese and stuff, they actually are able to, uh, marry the two concepts together a lot better. You know, so, it's like, they keep the human form and stuff, they round off the limbs, and of course, you know, uh, four fingers and a thumb. All that stuff, but they have enough of a mechanical aspect to it to keep it interesting and stuff. As you can see here, you know, these mecha, they literally are, um, they have that, <laughs> they have that lower arm replaced with like a cannon and stuff. And, you know, like, I, I don't really think the Japanese ever shied away from stuff like that. With a lot of Western media, you would notice that a lot of the mecha more or less had to conform to a certain amount of, um, human stylization and stuff and then with the japanese they were like okay well this can look human this doesn't have to look human and then they would also go and play around with it and they would get strange with it as well like you know as you can see with that attack that happened not that far back you know the dude goes and he kicks and like his foot's attached to a chain and you know i, th I think that with american mecca they try to ground it in uh realism a fair bit you know with like what the um, Android can and cannot do, you know, with the design and stuff. And we see that with Terminator a lot because a lot of it tries to be like ant anatomical. And then with the Japanese, they just don't care. And I actually kind of prefer that a little bit because it allows them to do kind of fantastical stuff. You know, it's like, I'm going to go and I'm going to punch you and I'm going to spontaneously have all these spikes pop out. And then, you know, I'm going to kick you and my foot's going to be attached to a chain and you know, it's very evident that the chain would not be able to fit inside my leg, but it's going to be a long chain. And I think I really kind of appreciate that a fair bit about, um, I appreciate that about how the Japanese do mecha in general. You know, like there's like a lot of elements that they use and a lot of things that they do that just kind of uh, makes it great. I also like how the Japanese have a tendency with all of their science fiction, they have a tendency to flirt around with the idea of, okay, what, uh, what makes us human, more or less.
And so we just don't really see that too often in Western media. Like, it's become more prevalent as um, time has gone on and stuff. You know, like, we see it more and more and more. But I think it's the Japanese that actually do it the best, especially when you go and um, look at, uh, what is it? Look at movies and shows like uh, Ghost in the Shell, for example. Ghost in the Shell is a pretty good example of that, I think, personally. But the Japanese will flirt around with concepts like, oh, okay, well, we, we have a machine that legitimately thinks that it's a human being. You know, and I just I really appreciate that. And we would see it a lot in a lot of these games as well. And I think that I just I really kind of love that because the uh the japanese will literally go and kind of push the envelope you know like they're always kind of pushing the envelope like i think that with western media a lot of it is okay we're gonna go ahead and play it say if this is where the line is at you know and then with japanese media they're kind of like always pushing that envelope always asking the question okay what makes a human being more or less what makes us human and then, you know, Western media kind of did that a little bit, especially with movies like Bicentennial Man and stuff. Uh, classic Robin Williams film, if you've ever, uh, if you've never seen it, I, I highly recommend it. It's really, really good stuff, but I think that, um, I think the games like this really just kind of go and they remind me of how Japan at the time was kind of going and reinventing the wheel with a lot of things, because this game goes and it's like, oh, okay, well... You know, we have this classic design and stuff, but we're also going to flirt around with other concepts, and... I... I just, I kind of miss that a fair bit. We just don't really see that too often anymore. So many robots, holy hell. You know, I hate to admit it, but in many ways this game was like a real huge guilty pleasure for me. Because for some reason there seems to be like this stigma that kind of revolves around where mashing buttons is a uh, sign of like not being skillful. And what a lot of people don't realize is sometimes you just want to mash buttons for the sake of mashing buttons. Because it's just like really enjoyable and stuff. And I always kind of laugh at that a little bit because some people are like, oh, you know, mashing buttons is not fun, but oh god, what the hell happened here? But um, I find that I enjoy it, especially during brawlers and stuff, and I think that kind of stems back to um, my time playing Double Dragon. Like, I remember just getting in there and just mashing fucking buttons and crap and just having an amazing time with it. Most of the time I have a tendency to just go and play like a lot of RPGs and stuff that are like uh, a lot of reading and a lot of careful thought and stuff to like what you do and how you do it. But man, sometimes it just feels good to load up a game like this and just mash the hell out of those buttons. You know, like I remember I was button mashing so hard that I was actually really worried about the, uh, the Odin that I was filming this on. I was really worried about damaging the hell out of it. Because the buttons themselves, while they have that gummy bear membrane, and it does like a pretty good job of softening the blow, I was afraid that I was like button mashing so hard that I was screwing up the board beneath it. And you know, the board is sturdy, obviously. It's like well, <clears throat> it's uh, well screwed down and stuff, and it's, it's got some pretty good uh, reinforcement to it, but I was just so afraid of screwing it up because I'm just sitting there and I'm mashing it and I'm having a good time with it, you know, and... In the back of my mind, I'm like, I hope I don't fuck this up. I hope I don't fuck this up. I hope I don't break this damn thing. This thing was really fucking expensive. I hope I don't fuck it up. <laughs> you know? It was, um, it was really just one of those things, I think. Oh, man. And then this, uh, this shameless reskin right here. Oh, jeez. We're essentially going to create the same damn character, except we're going to make him black, and we're going to make certain aspects of him skinnier. And then we are going to literally paint his ass green. Oh, man. <clears throat> I understand that reusing assets goes and saves time. I, I get it. But damn, son. 
I am so solemnly waiting for somebody to see me going and fighting this mini boss and being like, that is racist. I am so waiting on it. Oh man. So good. I have no idea why, but this particular segment in general really reminds me of uh, Comics Zone a fair bit. Like, I used to play the hell out of Comic Zone growing up as a kid. Like, I really enjoyed it so much. And for some reason, every time I wander through a sewer zone, I just keep expecting, like, the Comic Zone sewer theme to start playing. And I really hate it. <laughs> Because I know it's not going to happen, and yet for some weird reason, I start to expect it. So I'm just kind of sitting here going, oh, okay. You know, it's this, it's that. All right. You know, that's cool. Okay. You know, like, <laughs> it's just really one of those things, I think. <laughs> oh, man. I hated this mini boss so much. Oh, jeez. I've seen uh, quite a few of this design as well, I think, out of uh, Japanese uh, developers. The whole robot rolling around on a ball. I've seen it in quite a few games. I don't so much see it in, like, animes and, like, manga and stuff. I definitely see a lot of it, though, in gaming. Like, there are so many games that have actually used this design. Now, granted, the top half is a little bit different, right? You know, sometimes it's a lanky robot, sometimes it's like a really uh, beefy one, like that one that just went down, but the design is, um, I feel like it's kind of overused a little bit. Oh, here we go, the last area. Yeah, like, I, I noticed, like, a lot of these older 90s, well, um, I would have to say uh, late 80s and then all the way through the 90s style games. Um, they always have, like, quite a few of them back then always had, like, an obligatory rope level where you're just kind of going down a rope very slowly, uh, being expected to punch out every single enemy that you go and uh, you meet and stuff. I remember Battletoads doing stuff like that and... It's kind of interesting to see the phases that um, development goes through. It's almost like they all host a meeting one day, right? Like they have a giant convention and they're like, okay, all right, guys, we need you to listen closely. For the next decade, all of our characters are going to have robotic arms. They're going to be wearing Nazi helmets. And then every other level is either going to be a sewer level or a rope level. This is how development needs to go for like the next 10 to 15 years. Does anybody have any objections? And then of course, you know, the whole crowd cheers. And then we proceed to see this shit for the next 10 to 15 years. <laughs> you know, like I kind of laugh at it a little bit, I think. I go and I look at it and it's just kind of like, well shit, here we are, you know. Told that robotic monkey to go fuck himself. You know, I think it's actually kind of interesting because, you know, we have like all this high tech stuff going on in this game. We've got robots walking around all over the place, and yet the design for the cars looks like they rolled out of the fucking 30s. Oh, jeez. And then, of course, you know, the robot's hungry, so he's got to start munching on me. Oh, man. And then, you know, the uh, the Ed 209 build is just so classic. Like, you, you always saw, like, a lot of that in the 80s and 90s where robots had um, inverted joints. And they would just kind of, like, stomp around with their tiny little T-Rex arms and stuff. And you don't really see that too much anymore. Like, not these days. Like, um, the... Oh god, what is it? The Robocop reboot that they did. 
still used that design, but I think that if it was literally not for the fact that it was already a pre-established design, I honestly don't think that it would have been used again. I seriously don't. And then at this point in the game, um, I noticed at the time SNK, for the later half of their development for a lot of their games, they would go and just reuse uh, boss rush modes throughout like a lot of the games that they would go and make and stuff. And I think that um, this game in general kind of suffers from that as well. I mean, I understand why they do it, you know? They're like, okay, well, we want to try to get our last bit of cash out of the player and stuff. But I think that between games on console doing it and then like every game on arcade doing it, I think I got kind of burnt out with it past a certain point, you know? Like I just didn't really want to see it anymore. And I'm actually kind of glad that we don't really see this too often in modern gaming anymore because in my mind's eye, it just starts to feel lazy. Like it literally feels like a lazy leftover that really should, uh, well, just shouldn't be there essentially and so I go and when I go and I have to do like these little mini boss rush mode things I just I don't really feel like I enjoy them as much as I should you know like I don't really feel like I'm doing anything new or relevant it's just like oh it's the boss that I fought like four stages ago oh he's back from the dead it's time to beat his ass again and that's pretty much where that's at for me I think so oh yes here we go the, uh, the obligatory cheese ball dialogue. And now I proceed to get my ass whooped all over the place. Yep, here it is. I always thought it was kind of interesting, I think, with, like, uh, SNK games and arcade games in general, because I noticed that as you would go through and you would play the game, the bosses in the other halves of the game wouldn't really be super difficult. Like, you could tell that they were there to kind of take your cash a little bit, but looking at it, you wouldn't really be like, oh, hey, you know, this is super hard. I noticed with SNK games, a lot of their bosses, especially on these shorter excursions that are, like, uh... 35 to uh, 35 minutes to an hour long. I noticed that the final boss for them always had like a ludicrous amount of health. I even noticed that in like Metal Slug because Metal Slug was like, oh okay, well we have this boss, but it would it would be a good romp, but the boss themselves wouldn't have a ton of health. And then you would go and get to the end of the game, and you would be like, oh my god, why the hell does this guy have like 10 times the amount of health that all the other bosses had? And, it was just really, I think, kind of an interesting thing, you know, and it kind of reminds me that arcades were literally out to make money and stuff, which is fine, that's how they stayed afloat back then. But I think that by today's standards, a lot of these um, core design philosophies wouldn't really survive too well. I mean, I personally don't mind them because I understand, for the most part, where they come from and stuff. I don't really care for it a super huge amount but I at least understand where it comes from but I think that if you were to go and uh, try to exercise this style of design philosophy these days that it wouldn't really go over too well I don't really think that a lot of the um, design philosophy of the uh, three or four stage boss fight would really go over too well either because I find that a lot of gamers just don't have the attention span for it these days when you see a lot of modern boss fights and stuff, they'll either be like one or two stage, but you don't see bosses that are like three or four stage anymore. And I think it's because people get bored very easily. So I noticed that there has been kind of, in many ways, a progressive retirement, you know, of that particular style of design. Part of me kind of misses it a little bit. Like, I didn't really like how some bosses were like really excessive with it in a lot of these old arcade games but when it's done well it's actually really fun and it kind of gives you a premium rush because you're sitting there and you're like oh man i'm on stage three we're almost done so when you go and you do beat that boss after going and fighting it for that long and stuff it's actually very gratifying literally like it's very 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 gratifying and stuff 
Man laying in that capsule the whole damn time. Jesus Christ, man. She could have gotten up and given me a hand. So, with that thought in mind, this has been the commentary and ramblings for Robo Army. Oh, yes, that one went straight into the weeds, as intended. So, for those that have come out tonight, I greatly appreciate your time and your energy. You know, I appreciate everything that you do. We're almost to the end of these commentaries. There are only two more videos after this, and that is it for the SNK line. Now, I have to go and plan what console I would like to mug next, because it's going to be a toss-up between Sega Genesis and SNES. I am sure that I will go and post a poll for it. But, thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. I hope you had a good time with it. And as always, be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. Don't act like a fuck. I hope you all have a nice night.